Good afternoon, Pascac Valley. Welcome to another session here live from Pascac Valley Hospital. Thank you for joining us this wonderful Tuesday afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Thomas John. I'm an orthopedic surgeon specializing in hip and knee arthritis and joint replacement surgery. I'm part of active orthopedics and sports medicine, and I perform surgery here at Pascac Valley Hospital. I just want to welcome all of you folks joining us live on Facebook and those of you who will be watching us later. This is an opportunity to go over some very pertinent questions as it pertains to bone health, joint health, surgery, recovery, and please, if you have questions at home, feel free to type in, and now's the time to ask away. So welcome. So this is going to be an interactive session, and Shannon is going to ask me a few questions. So the first question is, how can I improve my bone health? Now that's a very loaded question. So bone health has to do with how strong or how good your bone is. You may have heard the terms osteoporosis, for example. One of the uh, things that affect that is when you take a bone density scan. It tells you how strong your bone is. So what are the chances, God forbid, you fall it, whether you may break your hip, for example. So how do you make your bone stronger? So number one, exercise. It's very important. Yeah, I'm sure your doctor has told you this many times. Exercise, exercise, exercise. You want to maintain a good, healthy weight. And one number to kind of keep an eye on is what we call body mass index, BMI. And if you're curious what that is, after you're done with this live program, please type it in on Google and you can find out where your BMI is. Avoid a low calorie diet, right? You can go too much the other way as well. You want to eat healthy, good green leafy vegetables. Maintain a decent intake of calcium and vitamin D. And, you know, there's an often asked question in my office, how much is too much? So a recommended number is about 1,000 milligrams of calcium and about 800 international units of vitamin D. Luckily, this is already pre-packaged if you go over the counter, so it's readily available. So good vitamin intake is very important. You want to avoid tobacco use. This seems kind of common sense. Tobacco use is not very conducive to good bone health. It actually breaks down good healthy bone. Same thing with excessive alcohol intake. So anyone can have a, a, a drink of wine. That's not a problem, but when we go excessive, same effect. It can have a deleterious effect on good quality bone. Um, unfortunately, some things predispose us to uh, things. Other, For example, uh, female sex, the bones do wear out a little quicker than men, especially if you're over 50, uh, being a woman, if you're Caucasian, if you're African American. These are all kind of risk factors where bone health can be affected adversely. So Keep in mind and have a higher uh, sense of awareness when you go to your next physical and bring this up. Certain medications are important to understand. For example, if you're on certain cancer medications, if you're on seizure medications, even regular medicines like a proton pump inhibitor that you're prescribed routinely uh, for stomach upset, you know, those things in high doses can potentially predispose you to a weaker bone. So these are all things to keep in mind about bone health. That's a great question. So the question was, what is the difference between bone health and joint health? So just to clarify, bone obviously refers to our overall skeleton, whereas joint health is more specific. Those refer to the hinges that help us move our hands, our knees, our hips, and joints are very different because they're also covered, because they have to move against each other, they're covered by cartilage. And as a product of time, as you go on in life, they do experience wear and tear, what we refer to as osteoarthritis. So there are things that we can do to prolong joint health so you don't have to come see someone like me. So for example, back to square one, exercise, but not just any exercise, low impact exercise is very important. So things like a stationary bike. You know, things you watch on TV, for example, you have these floor pedals. Those are very important because the joints move, they self-lubricate, and it does cause lubrication, help keeps that joint fluid and healthy. 
You want to strengthen the muscles that span the joint, right? Because it offloads the amount of stress that the joint sees. So for example, if you have arthritis in your knee, you want to focus on strengthening the muscles that span that knee joint. So it takes the load away from that joint. So the next time you like to go on a walk, that joint doesn't keep getting worn out. Um, again, things like vitamins are very important. So vitamin C, for example, has been shown to reduce the, uh, uh, the predisposition, to, uh, predisposition to arthritis. Uh, there are certain vitamins that have been found helpful. I often get asked about glucosamine and chondroitin. While the research is 50-50 on its efficacy, there has been some data suggesting uh, positive uh, results in terms of joint health. So exercise, maintain a good uh, body weight, and keep moving. These are very important things. What are some common causes of joint pain? Right. So the question was, what are some of the common causes of joint pain? And this is kind of opening the Pandora's box. But I'll hit on some of the most common ones. So I often see patients in my office, for example, they were former athletes, football players, right? So, or if they've been in accidents. So post-traumatic is a big issue. If you've had previous accidents or if you beat up the joint and, uh, you know, just over time, if you've had previous surgery in that joint. Um, other causes of joint pain are things that affect the joint. So for example, cartilage wear can cause joint pain. Remember, the joint has thousands and thousands of nerve endings. So any one of those things can cause pain. Sometimes a tear in the soft pads called meniscus can cause pain and give you joint pain. Sometimes cartilage wear, sometimes tear in ligaments or tendons. These can all cause independent joint pain. And sometimes just regular wear and tear. Cartilage is missing, now bone is grinding on bone. And that's usually when folks come to see someone like me to have that taken care of. How is arthritis treated without surgery? So the question is how can we treat arthritis without an operation? Believe it or not, about 80%, 90% of folks that come through my office are treated non-operatively. I am a surgeon and I do surgery, but a vast number of folks are able to come in and go home without talking about an operation. So we have a couple of tricks up our sleeves and what we call modalities. Number one, uh, there are injectables. This is very important and kind of a mainstay in my practice. So we have, let's say it's really flared up and you come in with a lot of fluid. You have a lot of pain. One of the quickest measures to address that we drain some of that fluid and we can give you something called steroid and that's a cortisone uh, injection coupled with some kind of pain medicine and that'll kick in pretty soon and really alleviate that discomfort. We have other injectables like hyaluronic acid uh, and this has been proven to reduce inflammation and joint pain. Um, other injectables that are more experimental and are available but it's important to understand the research is still in the early stages like platelet-rich plasma and stem cell treatment, but it's very important to understand that this is not covered by insurance. Other treatments include medications you take by mouth to reduce inflammation and pain. There are topical creams. There's physical therapy. Again, the focus being strengthening the muscles that span the joint. There are external braces. Think of it like a scaffold. If your joint is wearing out, this supports it from outside. And now in our practice, we even do what's called pain control mechanisms where we try to numb some of the nerves that go to the joint. Let's say you're not a surgical candidate or you're just not there socially. That's another option that's available in our practice now. Are there alternatives to joint replacement surgery? Right, so these are kind of the uh, things that we were talking about earlier about alternatives uh, to joint replacement and that's a lot of the things that we've touched on, and that's primarily to remember, I always tell folks, if you're able to function with a reasonable amount of pain and you can do what you want to do, you don't have to go into surgery. And we can consider one of those things we mentioned earlier. Is there any harm in waiting? Right. So the question is, what happens if we don't wait? Right. And I always tell folks, and this may sound uh, pretty straightforward, but nothing bad is going to happen. You think of it, and it's a silly analogy, but think of it like a flat tire. You can certainly drive with a wobbly tire, but it is not ideal. This is a weight-bearing joint. I want us to be active and mobile. You want to be able to go to the store, be independent, and not depend on other folks. And so the downside of waiting, however, 
at what it does to the rest of the body. If you wait long enough on a weight-bearing joint and it's causing you to change the way you walk, well, guess what? It's going to affect other joints. So let's say you have a bad knee that you're putting off. It can affect the hip on the same side, your back, the other side, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one downside. The other downside is, let's say you end up taking a lot of medication to mask some of the discomfort. Well, over time, for example, something like an Aleve or Advil, it can affect your kidneys. It can raise your blood pressure and it can tear up your stomach. So there are certainly uh, adverse effects to resorting to other things um, instead of surgery. So there are certainly some harmful side effects to not addressing this in a timely fashion. At what point would you recommend surgery for joint pain? Yeah, so the question is when do we actually um, make the decision to perform an operation? So in my practice, if you come to see me the first time and you haven't tried anything, I certainly would implore you to try some of the other options that we mentioned so far. And it's very important because believe it or not, a good majority of folks are able to continue for a good period of their lives with those modalities. But what happens if you've tried it and it doesn't work? So that's one person that I would recommend joint replacement surgery. The other kind of person that I would recommend surgery is if your deformity or your disease is bad enough. Some folks come in where the bone on bone is so severe it's starting to kind of dislocate the joint or there's no space for any injections to work or they have such a hard time walking where the concept of trying something more conservative just does not seem reasonable. And that's a clinical decision that we make together as a team and they are at the point where uh, they're ready for a joint replacement surgery. How long is recovery from surgery? So the question is how long does this whole thing take? Let's say you make that brave decision to go forward with surgery. Typically for a hip or knee replacement surgery, uh, fortunately in the last few years, uh, there have been certain game changers. For example, pain control has gotten significantly better. These used to be painful surgeries. Now the biggest feedback I get are it's I'm a little sore. It's not the end of the world. So pain management has gotten a lot better. A lot of times these surgeries are done as an outpatient. So we have rapid recovery protocols where we talk about early mobilization. So you're not laid up in bed. So about an hour operation, I expect you to get up and walk within a few hours with a walker. And if you meet certain metrics with physical therapy, you know, they teach you steps. And if you're able to walk safely and get to the bathroom, certainly going home the same, same day is not unreasonable like it may have been in the past. And when you go home, a therapist will come to your home. And then you go do outpatient therapy. And I generally counsel folks about six weeks to get rid of the cane, driving about two, three weeks, you know, golfing about two months, depending on the person. So it's certainly a very reasonable recovery. So the question is what can and can't be done after joint replacement surgery? Remember, we're doing the surgery to really restore function. So we want to be able to allow you to do a lot of things. Now that means walking, low impact activities like bicycle, cross country skiing, playing tennis. So there are a lot of things you can do because remember, that's the whole point. I want you to get active. I want you to keep moving. It's all about restoring and reducing pain and restoring function. Now, to be fair, however, these are artificial parts and we want them to outlast you. So one of the things I counsel folks not to do are heavy impact activities. So if you want, never played basketball, but now you want to play basketball, probably not a good idea. Same thing goes for running. So the idea being heavy pounding on that newly replaced joint, it's not that you can't do it, but probably not advisable. As you can imagine, these things may wear out. Yeah, so robotic surgery is something very exciting. And here at Pascac Valley, we've been doing uh, a fair amount of these. And the idea being, I always tell folks, you know, you come to my office, you know how to get home. But think of it like if you had a GPS, you would have a fine-tuned approach to getting home. And the idea is very similar. As trained, fellowship-trained surgeons, um, you know, I know how to do a good, solid joint replacement. But robotic surgery fine-tunes the approach. It fine-tunes the angles. Uh, on how to place these implants. And remember, no single arthritis or no single knee, no single hip is the same. So that concept of one 
approach to all patient is kind of going to the wayside. And so this allows us to fine tune our approach to your pathology, to your disease, and give you the best positioned implant. And hopefully, and the data is still out, but hopefully allow you for a better recovery and a longer lasting implant. And this is something exciting we've been doing here at, at the Hackensack at Pascack Valley Hospital. So the question is, what's the effect of weather? Here we are in some, one of the coldest winters in the past couple of years. So what's the impact on um, my joint, right? So one of the most direct impacts, and this is not a, uh, a myth, is that cold weather does slow down what's called our joint fluid or synovial fluid. Everybody, you, me, all of us have joint fluid. Think of it like the lubricating, the WD-40 in our joints. But as we get older, some of that joint fluid is not as healthy as it ought to be. And especially in uh, winter weather, cold weather, it can get more viscous or it can get a little bit thicker, it's not as lubricating, and that could lend to an increased joint pain. The other thing I always tell folks, you know, a lot of people say, well, I know exactly when it's going to rain. Well, we now know that's not a, you're not crazy either. It increases pressure inside a confined joint and that may contribute to increased pain. So whether the temperature, uh, the barometric pressure all have effects on joint health. So these are our formal questions and I'm kind of uh, going to give some time and allow folks to gather their thoughts. And, you know, now's the time if you're watching home and Facebook, um, type in those questions. If you have anything related to hip or knee or regardless about orthopedics uh, and other body parts, you know, now's the time to ask them and I'm happy to answer them. Um, here on Facebook Live. You know, while you think about it, you know, I, I want to encourage you on that note, be careful out there on ice. Uh, be careful about the shoes that you wear, especially as the weather fluctuates. So today, as we're taping, the, uh, the sun is out, uh, the weather's a little warmer. But as these weathers, uh, the weather goes through wild fluctuations and it freezes overnight, be careful as you step out on what could be black ice. Be careful about slipping and falling. Take your time. Have a good sole shoe where you get a firm grip. Um, you know, don't hesitate to use an assistive device if you feel like your balance is off. It's very important. Uh, do try to get out there, get some sunlight. Uh, get out of the house and try to move. Obviously, wear your mask. Um, and, you know, uh, I think it's a tough season, but we'll get through it. How do I treat my knee from a fall? So the question that we got on um, live is, uh, how do I treat my knee after a fall? Right? Falling is no fun. It doesn't matter if you're a little kid or if you're older uh, in life. When you fall, it's trauma. And the knee is a very interesting body part. If you feel the front of the knee, there's not much cushion there. It's skin and bone. Right, so that's a very um, interesting body part. So guess what? All of the impact goes directly to the bone. And if you were to get an MRI right after, you probably will see fluid within the bone. That's what we call a bony contusion. Most of the time, fortunately, if you've been following these recommendations and your bone health is pretty good, a healthy person should be able to fall from standing and not break anything. Right, the good general rule of thumb, if you can stand right back up and put weight on it and walk, chances are you probably didn't break anything. Right away, put some ice on it. If you can tolerate it and it doesn't interact with your other medications, take in a leave or Motrin um, and do that for a couple of days, keep it elevated. Most of the time, this should calm down. Now, when do you come see me? Let's say you've done that for two, three days and the pain is still severe or right off the bat, you can't put weight on it, or it swells up significantly, then do me a favor, come in, let's get an x-ray, make sure nothing bad has happened, and then we'll go from there. What are your thoughts on turmeric and arthritis? Yeah, the question was, what are my thoughts on turmeric on arthritis? So that's a great question, right? So especially past couple of years, there have been a huge increase on holistic treatments, and I think that's a great, great uh, concept. Obviously, as an allopathic physician, my uh, research is limited on turmeric. However, I'll tell you, this has been used in Eastern medicine a long, long time. Turmeric in uh, particular have high antioxidant properties. 
and has beneficial uh, effects on not just joint health, but also blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is because it hasn't been studied in large scale scientific uh, reports, I can't tell you if you go to GNC and buy a certain turmeric tablet and you take that for three months, your joint is going to be improved. It doesn't quite work that way because it's not an FDA regulated product. But certainly I would say that if you have access to it, it certainly has potential beneficial effects. One thing I would advise you is if you're having surgery, I would ask you to stop. There have been some studies where a high use of turmeric has been shown to increase blood loss. So that's something you want to keep in mind. I need a left hip replacement. Are you in favor of the anterior approach? Yeah, the question is hip replacement and the approaches. That's another relevant question. The question is, how do we get to the hip? And the tried and true approach, approach that about 99% of the world surgeons do, that's what's called the posterior approach. There's a posterior lateral approach, and there's the anterior approach. And all of these uh, have been studied side by side, and there have been no significant difference uh, com from one compared to another. In terms of early recovery, pain, function at two and six weeks, or any long-term data. However, in my practice, if someone requests it or if they know a best friend who've had it, I'm happy to do the anterior or the posterior lateral. Uh, it, in my hands, it doesn't make a difference because I think they're all comparable. Um, and, you know, they used to be traditionally uh, used to incur a lot of muscle damage, large incisions. Um, no matter what approach you use these days, those have gone to the wayside. Any advice regarding the impulse menopausal women trying to avoid taking prescription medication? <clears throat> Yeah, the question is about gout and postmenopausal women. You know, gout is a very tricky uh, topic. It could be inherited. It could be due to um, uh, high levels of uric acid in your blood. It could be due to your diet. Sometimes it can be something called pseudo gout. You know, if you're not going to take medication, it's probably going to be fine if you can control it through diet. However, the issue becomes the frequency of your attacks. If you're someone who gets an attack once every couple of years, it's not a big deal. But if you get this every so often, then it becomes very problematic. One, it's very painful, as you probably know. And two, um, it can, over time, if you were to not address it through medication, these crystals can actually build up within the joint and break down the joint faster. So there are certain problems with not leaving it uh, attended. Um, oh, can robotic surgery be used if you replace it? Yeah, you know, robotics, um, there have been some limited use for revision surgery, but generally the use for it is not as useful. There is some newer research being done in those settings, but primarily these days robotics is being used for primary replacements or the first time operations. How do a severely damaged hip <clears throat> Yeah, the question is, does a really bad arthritis, so to speak, affect how you do surgery or the type of prosthesis? You know, that's a more interesting question. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, no one patient is like the other. So first things we do in our office setting is imaging. And oftentimes if that imaging is not sufficient, then we get advanced imaging, either CAT scan, MRI, et cetera. I'll tell you one example where you don't do standard implants if you were born with what we call congenitally dysplastic hips, or if you have some kind of a deformity, some folks are born with dislocated hips. So those folks would get slightly different implants on rare occasion, even custom-made implants. Otherwise, for most run-of-the-mill wear and tear arthritis, again, it's not one size fits all, but the standard knee replacement um, or hip replacement uh, implants should suffice. Are you accepting patients? Yeah, so in our practice, we're an in-network practice. We accept all insurances and uh, we're happy to see anybody uh, uh, you know, uh, who has issues and happy to talk and, and counsel you. Absolutely. Any other questions, feel free to ask. I'm, I'm all ears. I'm here to answer and discuss any, any relevant topics. Again, thanks for joining us here on this Tuesday afternoon in your busy schedule. And I want to take this opportunity to thank Shannon Freeman and uh, Justin um, here with uh, our Pascack Valley Hospital for giving us this opportunity to discuss with our community. 
It's been uh, absolutely fantastic to reach out, especially in this day and age where we have to resort to virtual meetings. I'm glad we can take this opportunity to really kind of connect with our community. So if no other questions, we're going to sign off. I hope you guys have a blessed week. Uh, take care.